know, if you had been a member of the Lutheran Church for a long time, and I'm talking like, you know, 60 years or, or more, then chances are you may remember a time when a person would make a special visit to their pastor before receiving Holy Communion. That would take place on like Saturday if you were worshiping on Sunday or Friday if you were worshiping on Saturday. And during such a visit like that, the pastor would sit down with you and he'd ask some questions. There would be, of course, the general questions like, how are you doing? How's things going at work? How's the family doing? But in addition to those general kinds of questions, there would be questions that would be more directly related to your spiritual life. Questions like, how's your devotional life going? Or what particular temptations might you be struggling with at this time? The purpose behind making that special visit with the pastor prior to taking Holy Communion was to assist the church member in doing what our text from 1 Corinthians calls for us to do. You see, in his letter to the Corinthians, we learn that a person should, it tells us there, examine himself or herself before they participate in this sacred meal called Holy Communion. Really, this old custom of making a special visit to the pastor prior to attending the Lord's Supper was, well, it was a good one. But as has been with so many things of the past, over the course of time, that particular custom, it faded away and is no longer practiced in most churches. I suppose there are good reasons uh, why that may have happened. Perhaps the main reason had to do with a change of lifestyle. You see, as congregations such as St. Peter's uh, grew bigger and as people's schedules grew more and more busy and complex, it, it just wasn't very practical any longer to announce your intentions to commune in that particular manner. No, things gradually changed to the point where, well, today, about all we really do as pastors is ask people to register for communion by checking the appropriate box there in the ritual of friendship. Now, if you were to ask me what is the best, the most scriptural method of administering the Lord's Supper, I would have to say it would probably be the way our ancestors did it back several generations ago when they would announce their intentions to commune and talk matters over personally with their pastor. But since that really is not a very practical approach anymore these days, I think the second best approach would be to periodically have a discussion, like we're going to have here this evening, where we talk about what it actually means to examine yourself before receiving the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in Holy Communion. You know, when Paul admonishes us to examine ourselves, there are three very key things that we do need to keep in mind here. The first thing to keep in mind is, is really pretty basic. It's simply knowing what this special meal is, at least to the extent that we are able to know such things with our finite minds. You see, my friends, this is not just any meal that is taking place here. No, this is the Lord's Supper. This is Holy Communion. Those words tell us that this is indeed a very important meal. This meal is more than some sentimental tradition that we Christians follow. No, what happens in this meal is indeed very special and very spiritual. And because that's so, our Lord has established very specific table rules, if you will. For instance, we know that the elements he used 
were those taken from the ancient Passover meal that we heard about in our Old Testament reading. He took bread and he took wine. Therefore, we dare not just, you know, willy-nilly substitute those elements with whatever we might think would be appropriate. Because if we do that, we run the risk of changing this meal into something different from what our Lord Jesus Christ had intended for it to be. Of course, the Lord's Supper, though, is more than a sip of wine and a bite of bread. On that first Monday, Thursday, that is when our Lord first instituted this meal, Jesus spoke of a unique connection between the bread and the wine and his very body and blood. Now, we sometimes refer to that unique connection there as the real presence. It's a way of describing that in the bread and wine, with the bread and wine, under the bread and wine, there is the real presence of Christ himself. Now, if that by itself is not enough to make us stop here and pause and, uh, and approach this meal with great reverence, then I don't know what will. Without a doubt, this is a very extraordinary meal which our Lord has given to us. But you know, that's not the only extraordinary thing we have connected here to this meal. In addition to receiving Christ's very body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine, our Lord Jesus also informs us that in this meal, we receive the forgiveness of sin. And that leads me to the second very key point we want to keep in mind about Holy Communion. See, when we examine ourselves before receiving this meal... We're not only examining our beliefs as to what this meal is, namely the very body and blood of Christ in and with and under the bread and wine, but we are also examining here tonight our belief as to what this meal does for us. And as I said, what this meal does for us is it delivers to us the forgiveness of sin. The very forgiveness which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ obtained for us through his suffering and his death there on the cross. Now for the person who longs for God's forgiveness, this meal is the absolute very best. For it satisfies like no other. However, for the person who does not recognize their need for forgiveness, this meal actually brings no comfort and no benefit. In fact, Paul warns us here in 1 Corinthians 11 that the person who does not recognize their sinful condition, he warns us in so many words, should stay away from this meal. Otherwise, they bring God's judgment on themselves. Obviously, the Lord wants us to approach this meal with repentant hearts. That is, hearts that are truly sorry for the sins we have committed in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. With that in mind, it is important to understand that sorrow for your sins is not some selective process where you confess only those sins which may be bothering your conscience while withholding those sins which you might have grown accustomed to and have become comfortable in committing. Coming to the Lord's table is not like that of, say, going to a restaurant where you're free to order here whatever you wish. As if to say, yes, Lord, I would like forgiveness for these particular things in my life, but as for these other th items of my life, these other particular sins, I think I'm just going to pass on your forgiveness on those because I'm not quite ready to relinquish those things at this time. No, my friends, when we come to the Lord's table, we are to come 
with truly repentant hearts. Hearts that take all of our sins, not just some of them, but all of our sins seriously. The question we need to ask ourselves is not how have I done in comparison to what I might think is right and wrong. Rather, the question we must ask ourselves before we go to this meal is how have I done in comparison to God's holy and righteous law? How does my life stack up against that divine standard? And of course the answer is it doesn't stack up very well. We fall short. As we come to communion, God certainly wants us to be aware of our sins and to be truly sorry for them. But at the same time, he also wants us to be confident that because of Christ Jesus, he will forgive our sins. And that leads me now to this third key point I'd like to share with you, the one to keep in mind as we participate here tonight in this sacred meal, and that is believe in the miracle of forgiveness. Believe in the miracle of forgiveness and the new life that miracle produces. In regards to self-examination before communion at the Lord's table, Martin Luther said, a person is well prepared and worthy who believes these words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do you believe those words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin? It really is miraculous when you think about it that we receive all the benefits of the death and resurrection of Christ in this sacrament. And you know, with that forgiveness, another miracle occurs. We receive what the Bible calls a new life. It's a new life because it's not like the, the old sinful life. It's different. It's a life that has been changed by the power of God's forgiveness. It is no longer under the tyranny of sin and controlled by that sinful nature, but rather it's a life that is now under the grace and mercy of God and a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated what that new life looks like. We saw that in our gospel reading. When He, He, washed the feet of the disciples. We saw it in his words when he said, love one another. And most powerfully, we see it in the cross. The cross where he took upon himself the sins of the world. That new life is a life of service. Not serve us, but service. Not two words, serve us, one word, service. Service in the name of Christ. So as you approach the Lord's table here tonight, examine yourself as God's word calls us to do. Remember, first of all, what this special meal is, that in, with, and under the bread and wine, you and I are truly receiving the very body and blood of Christ. Secondly, remember that, that chief blessing of this meal, which is the forgiveness of sins. That is forgiveness for each and every sin we have committed. And then finally, believe. Believe, yes, in the miracle of God's forgiveness. Believe also in the new life which forgiveness produces in each of us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.